Welcome to the Your Lifestyle is Your Medicine podcast, where we do deep dives into the topics of mind, body, and spirit. Through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies to improve your health and ultimately add health span to your lifespan. I'm Ed Paget. I'm an osteopath and exercise physiologist with a special interest in longevity. Today, my guest is Ted McDonald, or as some of you may know him, Barefoot Ted from Christopher McDougall's book, Born to Run. This book has changed my life and has changed the life of thousands of people around the world. Now, Ted is an entrepreneur. He runs the company called Luna Sandals. More about that later. And he's also a self-proclaimed mono ablador or monkey chatterbox. And you're going to get a little taste of that in this episode. Now, if you haven't seen Ted's Instagram, check out barefoot underscore Ted, and you'll get a pretty good idea of the amount of energy this guy has. In today's episode, Ted and I are going to take a deep dive into what lifestyle medicine really means for him. Now, coming away from this episode, you're going to have some practical tips and things that you can implement straight away into your life to add health span to your lifespan. Ted McDonald, welcome to the show. Right on. Hey, man, I'm totally stoked to be here. Uh, even though it looks like I'm in San Francisco right now, I'm in Santa Barbara and I'm filled with all kinds of cool stories that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Excellent. So I'm so excited to have you on the show because I've read, I read Born to Run when it first came out years and years ago. And I remember you from that book. You were one of the standout characters and your sort of passion around barefoot and your creation of the company Luna Sandals, which we'll, we'll talk about, I'm sure has been an inspiration for me and I'm sure thousands of other people around the planet. So thank you very much for, for agreeing to be on the show. Oh, thank you. That book has inspired so many people. Open the eyes to uh, what are some of the potentials. I mean, my take on it, I like to say that that book is like my quirky PhD thesis that I didn't have to write. It's kind of like covers all kinds of interesting things. You know, the great story that I get to be part of, of a group of people going down to the Copper Canyons to participate in this really obscure at the time uh, ultra marathon. But Christopher McDougall does such a great job in sort of teasing out of each of the characters some kind of glimpse into this uh, capacity and story that all human beings share. And I got to be sort of the front man of that sort of um, take on what it means to be human. And um, I think he did a great job in um, telling that story. And I think, I think a lot of people like you did, the Barefoot Ted character resonated in some way. And ultimately, you know, that was in 2006 that the events of that book happened. So my, I've been riffing in a similar way on health and, and fitness and life and everything um, such that um, uh, I've, you know, grown and developed and been able to um, sort of continue to expand on some of those themes. And I think one of the, for me, one of the take homes, one of the things that really inspired me about the book Born to Run was this, for the first time, pretty large group of people, basically everyone, but runners in particular, let's say, suddenly were seeing themselves from a perspective that they probably hadn't thought about before, i.e. This, this evolutionary biological way of trying to evaluate what it is that a human is, can do, should do, shouldn't do, mm -hmm. should eat, could eat, shouldn't eat. So there's kind of like, it's a, that, that opening, uh, and I think that book played a gigantic role in it. And I actually created a, soon after the book Born to Run came out in 2009, I, um, I remember starting a Google group that grew quite large on basically on riffing on the concept of barefoot running and what that might mean. And then, but it really boiled over quickly into, um, uh, you know, just like realizing for a lot of people, the epiphany that probably you shouldn't automatically assume that by default, the human body is broken and, um, and therefore start fixing it before you understand even how it works in its default state. And I believe that that riffing, those people picking up on that idea and starting to apply it to all kinds of other things. I mean, running shoes were so 
it was counterintuitive to think that less would be more. Mm -hmm. But once for many people, that became became the only way to move forward at all. So there had already been this realization that sometimes the guys that are selling us the stuff that we supposedly need may not know what we really need. And they may just be really good at selling stuff that we want because they teach us how to want it. And we assume that they know what they're talking about. It's not always the case. Yeah. And in the end, I think Born to Run teaches us to take some responsibility for our own journey and realize that some of the solutions are contained within our own head and attitudes. And sometimes we need to just experiment with that stuff because uh, after all, it's readily available, our own choices right now. So that's mm -hmm. how I take the book Born to Run. It's, it's reverberated all throughout the world. And I think it started a lot of other good, um, you know, everything from footwear, you know, I have a sandal company, sure, but food stuffs and attitudes about food, attitudes about medicine, attitudes about health in general have been going through this upheaval. And the most basic understanding that comes out of it all is that if you get your body in a vitalized, happy state, you can put a middle finger up to all the kind of contagions that that modern man is faced with. Dr. Daniel Lieberman, Harvard University uh, evolutionary biologist in his book uh, called uh, The Story of the Human Body, he calls most of the scourges of modern man are literally mismatched diseases. They're not evolutionary you know, genetic certainties. Right. They're, they're bad behaviors and crap food and bad attitudes and uh, bad medicine just infesting a terrible carcass that basically needs to scrape itself off of all that stuff if it can and see if it can regain that inner spark that made us the species that's as grand as we are. Nice. Well, I want to break that down a little bit and how you do that. Okay. So we've got the book Born to Run, which has been a catalyst for some people to get into the, the more of a barefoot lifestyle and start questioning, you know, what else can they sort of get rid of in their lives? And with, with lifestyle medicine, we look at different areas. And one of those areas is nutrition. So do you have anything special that you do or different from the, well, ho hopefully it's different from the standard American diet, but what do you, what's your take on nutrition? Uh, it is one of the areas that we are, you know, there's never been a better time if one were to want to start riffing and self-experimenting and trying to determine what the hell is going to be good for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you kind of get a clue. Uh, one of the things that got me inspired early on was starting to follow, like really take seriously the concept that, you know, we are a species that were either evolved or created in some way on a planet that is like, we're pretty well adapted to. Um, uh, we can, um, if we follow some of the, uh, if we get some of the hints at what our ancestors were doing, mm -hmm. we can start picking up on things that have been part of the human experience that aren't automatically considered to be poisons. Like I, I'm really into the concept of nourishing traditions, for example, everywhere, everywhere, grandmothers and people have uh, wiggled and jiggled and found ways to eke out a survival in all kinds of different environments. Yes. So there's, we've got this incredible heritage of foods, stuffs that um, often, if they've been around for innumerable generations, like really, often you can count on them to be, you know, less than terrible. But unfortunately, all the easy stuff and all the cheap stuff that we started making vast amounts of, from the seed oils to the, the way that they've treated certain kinds of animals, to the sugar, to the endless preservatives and additives and, you know, um, we've basically been trying to survive on Franken foods for quite some time now. And um, the results are palpable. I think the wealthiest nations have the sickest people. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, the people with the access to more food. So that's obviously not food. Whatever, whatever it is that's been, you know, whatever gets overly stimulated by capital and um, junk science and mismanagement and hide the story, you know, 
But I think so. I've had to start learning how to swim out of that current. And um, many people find different ways. These days, it's pretty clear for me. I eat like high quality foods, quite a bit of quality meats, quite a be beautiful, uh, you know, I go to farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, uh, you know, I, but at the same time, I'm able to travel to other countries and I'm willing to eat foods, you know, back to this grandma's table or whatever. I'll eat whatever I see healthy, you know, people eating that has been made, you know, prepared with love at any table, anywhere, at any small village or family anywhere in the world. But the Franken foods and the fast foods and, uh, you know, mostly. And one of the things that's been really blowing my mind, um, I got about, it's been quite some time now, but way back when I was just starting to get into running, so it must be like 2007, eight, nine, something like that, more into it, you know, I got introduced to this guy, Mark Sisson, who sent me a book called the, uh, what was that called? The Primal uh, Blueprint. Primal right? Blueprint, yes. Yeah, Yeah, and I had never read, I mean, I haven't reread that book in a long time, but what it got me doing was starting to riff on, you know, I, I got some new avenues to explore to start testing on myself. And it just started planning out quite quickly some of the um, things. And I really appreciated in that book at the time, I was really, I'm really not interested in sort of like political movement food uh, choices or like I'm, I'm eating this way to save the planet. It's like, yeah. I think people need to save them themselves first, you know, save mm -hmm. yourself, save the ecosystem of your own body. Uh, make sure you're not poisoning that to death to save the world for people to just kill themselves eating foods that are saving the world. No, no, I really can't. I can't tolerate that anymore, particularly after I've seen the decimation over the last several years of people who, you know, weren't even vitalized enough to take on uh, a tiny little virus, you know, that, well, who knows? It's a, it's a right. terrible, terrible situation, but a lot of people suffered unnecessarily because they were loaded with comorbidities mm -hmm. from basically being polluting their own ecosystem mm -hmm. for you know generation or you know for decades let's say and you know if you if you pollute your body for decades on stuff that it wasn't designed to take on you're 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 the you're the ecological disaster now the goal here i guess through this talk is learning how to find a strategy a lifestyle that is avoiding the stuff that's going to kill your ass and putting in more of the stuff that's been there's lifespan and there's health span. Yes. And you can keep some poor sucker alive for a long time, feeding them through a tube and giving them drugs and all the rest. But health span is I want to be vital and I want to be able to enjoy living. And um, if you can't do, if you don't have those two capacities in, at hand, you're probably going to be very unhappy. Um, you know, you take a hunting dog and put that guy in a cage and give him crap food, don't let him go outside. That beautiful specimen of a hunting dog, predigreed and everything, is going to die in its own vomit and shit not too far in the, in the future. So let's not do that, folks. You should be the owner of yourself and learn how to take good care of yourself and get some ideas from other people out there who have figured out how to do it one way or another, not just to follow them lockstep, but what the hell did they do? What is it about what they've done that allows them to talk like that? And we'll get into that, but that's how I talk. Perfect. You mentioned, uh, you said nourishing traditions. Did you mean to quote a book called Nourishing Traditions? Because there is one. I did. I did. Yeah. yeah, that's a fabulous book. In other words, what I try to get into there is, you know, uh, I mean, it's great to get back to the primal basics of whatever it is that humans have been consuming and using. I mean, there's so much pollution control in um, modern Western humans and everywhere else, too, uh, that you got to take care of that you've built up over time. And so much of the stuff that people have basically been building their bodies out of is absolutely not ideal to build bodies out of. So, you, you know... Part of the lifestyle is just learning how to get rid of the stuff that you do not need. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was, you know, that's been part of it. And nourishing traditions is just to give people an idea that mm, there are reasons why certain cultures, you know, not all foods are good, but certain cultures figure out how to 
reduce their um, disadvantages, let's say over time by figuring out how to ferment them a little bit or how, and I just want to keep, I don't want to make people have to just break their, uh, you know, break from every tradition and every kind of thing to try or all kinds of foods out there are, you know, that were all bad in other, uh, although I do think for a lot of people, it makes a lot of sense when they're, when they're um, making a transition from an unhealthy lifestyle to a healthier one probably do it it does require like learning how to like uh see what parts of uh your diet you can get rid of and uh for us you know in a disciplined sort of way let's say to start being able to get a sense of where you are what you know find out whether you can really really something will benefit you you've got to have the capacity to do some research and then some discipline to see if you can you know go through with some kind of uh, new way of eating that you haven't done before, getting rid of something entirely or adding something that you never had. Sometimes those little, those little experiments um, can yield a lot. And then of course, if you have access to somebody who really is an expert, who really can, uh, has the patience or capacity to get to know who you really are, um, and then who's proven through their own research and ex practice with others and themselves that they have I think that's going into the future. I think more and more people are going to want to see. I mean, I would recommend um, interact with um, doctors and healthcare practitioners and um, and um, who whose own lifestyle <laughs> and, and patients sort of give us give you some understanding of where they're where they can yeah. take you. You know, you know what I, I I really think that's going to be the going into the future. Um, you know, just telling, letting your own life tell the story of what it is that you're capable of doing, and then your own uh, patients or clients or uh, whatever students, uh, they can riff on that and see where they can go from there. So, I, I mean, that's how I talk on that topic. Love it. There's a, a guy called Paul Check who, who always says, if you have a, a male doctor, ask them to take their shirt off. If they haven't, if they're not kind of ripped or looking healthy. And walk out. <laughs> it's so true. Come on. That's a base. Look, I mean, it really, people should approach it like that. We have these capacity to just look at animals moving and understand yes. what is going on. Right. I mean, it's, I, I started recognizing that when, as I started running, about, I don't run like a madman endlessly, endlessly. Although I really, I really see running like surfing. And sometimes I, you know, you get hankering to go see test yourself on the big waves like these mm -hmm. longer races or whatnot but in my daily life I approach running like surfing and it really is about just the exhilaration and joy of it it's not about overtaxing myself it's about getting into a flow state it's about moving in such a way that you are palpably and clearly making yourself feel better and you're getting stronger while you're doing it I mean this is the I think that strategy when a human has that as an option and, you know, different indigenous and there's been different little microcultures that have popped up all over the world that didn't have an issue mm -hmm. with um, uh, having enough, like uh, South, uh, South Seas Islands, various little pop. And when people um, are allowed to, you know, have enough uh, to survive, they get to thrive. And to thrive, it's about, you know, it's all the wonderful things that you can do in a healthy body, which means you can move around in complex environments on the planet and enjoy the whole process all the time, you know? I mean, that is a bird flying through its environment, a deer trotting over its own terrain, um, a human being in um, normal human fitness levels that used to be common individuals have to take responsibility for their own health care no one out there there's no there's no cookie cutter solution i mean they're not going to be able to come up with a shot and just give you a shot and you're going to be okay and you just go back and get a shot every time to be healthy for whatever it is you got to become the miracle making medicine machine that's what human beings do our bodies are continuously always and particularly when they're healthy and vital dealing with all kinds of things and they are experts at this stuff and they thrive on it matter of fact when you don't have any work to do it starts attacking your own body in some cases but 
a vital body is ready to fight for you. And um, damn it, let it do its work. And one of the ways is to just make sure you don't feed it on poison all the time and get it into a vital state. I pretty sure as many of us and I can attest to, the benefits are well worth the, the, the work required to learn how to do it. The benefits are well worth it. And I'm 58, will be 59. And I'm like going, I wouldn't, I, my, my riff has been learning how to get better and healthier as I get older rather than the opposite. I'm so sick and tired of the endless mouthing of I'm yada yada and blah, 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 therefore yada. It's like, get it out of your mind, man. Don't assume that a human being cannot be healthy, fit, and vital through its entire career. It can be, it, it should be. And the only one who's going to make that happen is the individual. I mean, they've got their own puzzle to solve. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes at it. I mean, some people obviously have much harder hills to climb, but climb that motherfucker. Excuse me. <laughs> climb that hill. You can start riffing on taking care of your body without a penny by just making a different decision about what you're going to do next. And so getting people, that's, I think I'm going to, and Paul checks a good example of a person who, really on a high level was able to investigate all of these kind of avenues with incredible, you know, having cohorts of young soldiers back in the day and being able to literally see what they're eating and see what they're doing and see how they're feeling and make them work. Oh my gosh. I mean, those kind of teachers outside of the medical establishments, which unfortunately have been over by bad management and terrible, uh, you know, pushers of, of pharmaceuticals that, you know, nine times out of 10, seriously, nine times out of 10, probably that drug wasn't necessary for that person if they just did X, Y, and Z. It's kind of looking like that more and more. So, mm -hmm. but there's a crap ton of money in that world and there's no money. There's no incentive for anybody to take care of themselves other than, hey, this is the, if you don't believe you, you yourself, the body you're in is the, you know, the most important thing you have access to and that you can take care of. How you take care of yourself really ultimately tells me everything I personally need to know about any human being. Now, having compassion's important. I mean, I, I, I don't want to go around clobbering everybody who, you know, is not healthy or making unhealthy. I mean, it's, it's undoubtedly an extremely uh, complex situation. Many people are suffering on so many different levels um, that it's very, very hard uh, to uh, blame them. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, the way out is for them to find a way out, and the way out will be simpler than they imagine. It's probably going to be, ultimately, I'm seeing a lot of these um, contagions of the modern life from depression to di diabetes and all the rest. Yeah. These are nutritional problems. These, these don't, these, if you haven't gone too far to the, over the cliff, you can start making differences immediately by getting certain things out of your diet now. That yeah. maybe, maybe you have some insights into that you'd like to share, but that's what I know. Mm -hmm. I know people can start right now if they wanted to. They could, they could, they could make certain decisions about how, what not to do that if they were really serious about taking care of themselves and they were do do this, that, or the other, they would start seeing an immediate change in their overall health. I, I think more of that, the testimonials of things like that probably reach, you know, reach a lot of people because when you feel better and you look better, you are better. Exactly. And people just naturally gravitate that people want to know what is it that makes you that way? Now you're known for running ultra marathons like Leadville, uh, the Copper Canyons. Are you still doing that? Well, I am, but I mean, I've turned that dial way, way down. I mean, in other words, it was like what those, what those ultra marathons. Uh, it's back to the idea of like big wave riding. Yeah, it's like it. First of all, it it gets gives you an opportunity and i've done it many many hundred mile type races particularly that leadville one I've, I've started it like seven times finished four 
it's a tough one because you're going from sea level to, t you know, 10,000 feet, you know, more than 3000 meters. The whole race is very high. Yeah. And, uh, which is, you know, already gives you a kind of a deficit. Um, and it's, it's got, it's, it's, but it's like what those hundred mile races became for me is kind of like living a lifetime in a day. And what I used to say is if you don't feel good at 50, you're not going to make it to a hundred. <laughs> you know, it's like, you've got to learn. It's all about learning how to conserve. It's learning how to be very focused on your body and its needs. It's very focused on movement, how you're moving. It's all about continuously being hyper aware, at least for me, this is my style, right? Hyper aware of what's happening to you what are, and learning how to just modulate and organize yourself in such a way so that you can allow yourself to take on this very, very big wave. And so it becomes a great, uh, pure, primal way of testing your metal. Where are you in this space? How can you stack up when you give yourself such a massive challenge? And um, it gives you an extremely large amount of confidence in yourself when you learn how to pull that together. Because it's really, right, it's a... It's, a, it's like boxing or something. It's a way to show, you know, here it is. This is, I mean, it's even, it's even pure. You and the mountain go. And so in that process of figuring that out, I learned how to find a way that I could um, ex uh, uh, evaluate where I was in my own ability to keep at a high level, high enough level of training that I could do something like that. But my riff was always, what's the least amount that are the smallest dose that gives the greatest benefit. I'm not, I'm always trying to, you know, it's, and it is a kind of a zigzag pattern, let's say, but yeah. I'm always trying to find what's the most efficient way to get to the place where you can be efficient enough to do something like a hundred miles in a day and be able to walk away with that not broken. Mm -hmm. That to me became kind of like, and I learned so much through that, that now though, more and more, I'm wanting, I no longer feel like I, I need to prove that to myself per se, although I will, I will do some more. I, I am periodically doing different interesting things all the time and I dream of other things all the time. But my real goal is about doing it in a way that the process itself is all about this joy ride. It's all about basically why not do more and more and more and more of your life in that place where you are on the board in command of the wave in the curl. And it's basically easy. You're mm -hmm. just, you've just got everything all perfectly balanced. And so now instead of being in a situation where you're being pummeled and having to struggle and fight to be in the whitewash of the wave, you're riding it. You're riding it. You are voting for the universe you're going to continue to surf into. And mm -hmm. the ideal position seems to me to be in that flow state, which ultimately is this dynamic balance between super hard and super, you know, it's like it and boy, the feeling of it when it's all dialed in. And that's why I love the balance sports. That's why skateboarding in particular, running is also one of them in my mind. I really visualize myself as creating an energetic wheel. And I really, really try to find those sweet spots that feel smooth and feel good because I know our ancestors and any other critter would stay in that space, mm -hmm. right? There's no need to like go to the red line all the time. When I turn 60, I'm going to, I'm, I'm calling 60 the new 21, right? I feel like I'm getting closer and closer for myself. This is for myself. It's taken me a long time to master the process. I mean, and I'm not even there yet, but I do believe when I'm 60, I'm going to use that as a, like, okay, I can start speaking with like more confidence about what I've learned and because I'm an elder now, you know, people probably want to hear what I have to say. And I've been sort of like, dribbling it out because I, you know, I'm still learning myself. I'm still learning myself, but 
when I'm 60, healthy, happy, have these things, I think people will listen to me more. And I think I'll hopefully by then be able to have some more, you know, a more, I don't know, maybe some, somebody to point to or some little something to point to that allows them to, you know, get on this similar, a similar riff. But for yeah. the time being, I'm just stoked to see more and more and more and more people, you know, because of these tools that we all have, getting good information about different insights, about different ways of approaching things that might have been different from what we heard in the past. But here it is in living color, and it looks like it's doing pretty good for that person. And they don't work for a pharmaceutical company, and, and they just simply, you know, are trying to express what it is that makes them happy and works for them. I like a world like that. I think, I think we can get a lot of good done doing, doing work like that. Nice. One of the, the tenets of lifestyle medicine is community. And from the running and from the book, the creation of Lunar Sandals came about. And I want you to talk to us a little bit about your community, maybe Lunar Sandals, maybe it's bigger than that. I'm not sure. But tell us a little bit about how community fits in your life. Yeah, that's a great question. I've always approached most of these events as essentially a kind of pilgrimage in a way. And what I mean by that is pilgrimaging is just where you get a bunch of human beings who more or less don't know each other or haven't known each other before or don't know each other in a living everyday way who are all together vulnerable in some way. They're in nature, they're making a journey over land. And the process of being in that landscape and being vulnerable together and um, whiling away this time together you basically get this situation where you have talk therapy, nature therapy, movement yeah. therapy, all happening at the same time. And you get all these different kinds of people being able to interact with each other in a caring and thoughtful way, overcoming their hangups and their ideological possessions and whatever it is that's, and start helping them realize that if in this space, which is very primal and normal for human beings to be in, some of the best shit happens. So I'm really, really getting motivated to more and more help engender more of those kind of environments where people can come together and share a new environment and share time together in that new environment. And I've seen that be an incredibly valuable healing uh, modality, let's say. There are, there are 21 missions that line the California, basically, coast, and they're generally about a day or so apart. And I like to think of those missions as hardware, and the humans are the software. And humans can program that hardware to do anything they want. And I want to program it to sort of create these op opportunities to do more and more of this, um, these longer walks, hop, hikes, runs, together, but without any especially time or, you know, more along the lines of just creating that yes. opportunity, those, those opportunities to do that, whatever way it can be, I'm going to be getting more into that. And ultimately, so it's the pilgrim, the pilgrim idea. And then on that note, just within the last couple of months, we, Luna Sandals, we got um, uh, some filmmakers in, uh, in France sent us some footage of a film they're getting ready to release that is features them sort of like doing this kind of pilgrimage in their lunas along the, you know, the Santiago. Santiago. And um, yeah. it's, they're, they're getting ready to take their film. We're gonna be, we'll, we will be sharing it, but they're getting ready. It's a really beautifully done film, very, very minimalistically done, but just sort of, it was like externalizing this whole year I've been, focusing on this pilgrimage I did they look so that's one of the in the end being able to be the president not of a surfing company not of a skateboard company not but of a sandal company which has the same it's being able to get those boards and that inspiration and that uh, into the hands of people that go out there and being able to sort of vicariously share through their stories and their pictures all that good energy that's created because well, because I was wanting to solve the problem of how I could have a comfortable sandal that would allow me to do all these things. I've been able to sort of, that's the message I want to share with your, with your audience is that by you solving the riddle for yourself, 
you're going to get insights that will help you possibly help others solve the riddle. You know, you'll, you're kind of carrying the flame forward and um, you're going to have a unique insight that's going to help you. And that's going to, that's going to create, it's just this endless positive rever reverberations that just keep doing good as they spread out. And I think when you really make a product or have a service that really does good for your customer, client, whatever, that's the that's the fastest way to allow good to spread consensually and freely that's ever been known to man. Right there, do that and watch what happens. That's what I'm doing. I'm loving it. I want to do it more. I think that is oh, that's actually a beautiful way to finish the show as well. It's it's you summarized it. All the different aspects of your lifestyle have come together for you, but it also allows you to pass that torch forward. That's brilliant. Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for thank you so much, Ted, for being on the show, the Lifestyle is Your Medicine. That was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, totally enjoyed it. Thank you for letting me talk so much. Thank you for joining me in my conversation today with Barefoot Ted McDonald. Now, if you enjoyed listening to this and learning from this podcast, please leave a comment and or a suggestion for a future guest that you would like us to feature. In addition, on Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review and you can also leave some comments there. If you want my direct help, send me an email at ed at edpaget.com or visit my website, edpaget.com. And last, but certainly not least, Thank you for your interest in lifestyle medicine.